precincts out there. So the districts, the numbers don't always go together, although our district's numbers are a little bit apart. Uh, that can be kind of confusing, and where the, the lines begin and end is sometimes pretty close. But uh, so what we're going to do, after we briefly introduce each, uh, each of us, introduce ourselves, we're going to, uh, uh, we have a presentation, and we're going to each talk with some remarks about some things that happened in the Legislative Assembly, and then after that, we will, we'd love to take any and all questions and things that are on your mind that you'd like to talk about. Hey everybody, I'm Jennifer Boisco. I represent the 86th District, which is right next door. Um, I have two precincts in Loudoun County, um, Sully and Forest Grove, and um, the majority of my district is in the Herndon area, so it's Herndon, and um, I'm looking forward to talking with you all tonight. I am Jennifer Wexton. I represent the 33rd District in the Virginia State Senate. Uh, I've been there since 2014. My district um, starts in Leesburg, uh, so it has all of Leesburg, parts of Ashburn, all of Sterling, uh, Her Dulles, Herndon, parts of Chantilly. And before before we get started with our with our the uh, educational part of our town hall, we have a resolution that we are delighted to have an opportunity to present. And so. I would like to call to the front of the room Gab Gabriel Filippini and his little brother Lucas, if they would be willing to join us. So, come right in the middle, guys. Lucas, do you want to stand up on the thing so everybody can see you? Okay. So. One of the wonderful things that we get to do in the House of Delegates and in the Senate is we get to recognize extraordinary actions and really amazing people. And I have them right here, a couple. So I'm going to read to you uh, that we have House Joint Resolution 95A, commending Gabriel Filippini. Agreed to by the House of Delegates, February 17, 2017. Agreed to by the Senate, February 22, 2017. So I'll get started and we're each going to read a little bit of it. Whereas Gabriel Filippini, a student at Parkview High School in Sterling, used innovative 3D printing technology to help create a prosthetic hand for his six-year-old brother. And whereas, whereas Lucas Filippini was born with an underdeveloped left hand, making it difficult for him to master everyday tasks such as tying his shoelaces, zipping up a jacket, and holding items with both his hands. And whereas with his younger brother on a wait list for, his, for a prosthesis, uh, Gabriel Filippini approached Kurt O'Connor, one of his teachers at Parkview High School, about using the school's newly acquired 3D printer to create a prosthetic hand. And whereas Gabriel Filippini and Kurt O'Connor collaborated with Enabling the Future, which provides open source designs for 3D printed prosthetic limbs, and Makersmith, a nonprofit organization in Leesburg that provided knuckle joints to develop a prosthetic hand and. Whereas Gabriel Filippini and Kurt O'Connor provided Lucas Filippini with his new prosthetic hand on his birthday on June 17, 2016. Since receiving the hand, Lucas has achieved motor skills that many other children take for granted and he continues to overcome challenges. And? Whereas Lucas Filippini's achievements are an inspiration to the members of the Loudoun County community, and Gabriel Filippini and Kurt O'Connor have begun to create larger hands to ensure that Lucas maintains his mobility as he grows, as he grows now, therefore be it. Resolved by the House of Delegates and the Senate concurring that the General Assembly hereby commend Gabriel Filippini for his work to provide a prosthetic hand for his brother and be it. Resolved further that the Clerk of the House of Delegates shall prepare a copy of this resolution for presentation to Gabriel Filippini as an expression of the General Assembly's admiration for his life-changing use of technology. Yeah.
So um, we thought, we, we, we talked a little bit about the you know, best way to handle the, the subject matter areas, and we think it, it probably would work best rather than having three of us give three different versions of what happened um, for each of us to take kind of the subject matter area. And um, I'm going to let Delegate Bell go first with his. Thank you. A uh, couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, first off, uh, pay raises. We entered the General Assembly session this year, and we do two-year budgets in Virginia. Uh, the budget is passed on the even years, and uh, all the best experts get together and come up with what the best estimates are for what revenue is going to be, and then we make a budget based on that. Our budget is always a balanced budget. In fact, some years we have surpluses, and that goes, uh, can be used for any number of things. We also have a rainy day fund, which can be used for times when it's raining, and we've had a few of those when the economy wasn't so good. So. Uh, 2016, the best estimates were put together, and unfortunately, when we entered this year, we were short about $1.2 billion, a uh, pretty large sum of money. Uh, so the first thing we had to do is make some pay cuts, uh, and those are tough decisions uh, to, to get that budget balanced. Uh, but the thing I'm really proud of is, in spite of that, we were able to, to also do some really good things and give pay raises in places that were badly needed. Uh, our state troopers. Uh, we gave our state troopers a 6% pay raise. And we also gave, uh, the, we raised the starting salary uh, a little over $6,000 to $43,000 a year. Uh, it's still not a lot of money for, for our heroes who are out there every day putting their life on the line. And uh, in the past year, I've done a ride along in Loudoun County with our sheriffs and also with our Virginia State Troopers. And uh, I tell you, every time they get out of the car, they don't know what they're facing. So this is exactly uh, what we need to do. I'm really glad in a bipartisan way we all came together and realized that that was so important to, to give uh, those heroes a pay raise. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the pay and the cost of living in our area, we're losing so many troopers to other places. Uh, the week I did a ride along with the state police, we actually lost two troopers to Texas. And they went to Texas to become, um, uh, what do they call them, state troopers, long, long horns, whatever they are down there. Uh, but area, they, they moved to a lower cost area and got $20,000 pay raises. So that's what we're competing against because uh, we lost troopers that were at 10 years of experience. So they're really at the peak of their performance and uh, we've invested a lot of money and they've invested a lot of time and effort and they didn't want to go, they didn't want to leave Virginia. So it's important that we, we do the right thing. Uh, but again, these are, these are tough choices but I'm thrilled we were able to make those choices. We also uh, pass some money down so we can make sure our teachers get pay raises uh, because they're badly needed and they're long overdue. Uh, at least one person here is very happy about that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, another thing we did is mental health. Uh, this is a, a, a tough issue. We put $23 million of funding towards mental health and a big part of that is substance abuse. And that's something we're going to talk about. Uh, I know Senator Wex is going to talk about that and we're all going to share a little bit on that because that is uh, a big deal right now, we've got an opioid crisis going on all around the country and especially here in Virginia. And we put some money towards that. And this uh, was primarily for same day intake uh, and assessments and also community service boards. Uh, a big deal is when someone is ready to go into treatment for substance abuse, there has to be an avenue to get them in treatment as soon as possible. Because often that's a really crisis situation, it's very fluid, it's difficult, and when the decision is made to go to treatment, uh, we need to do everything we can to open the door to get into treatment. Thank God we were able to put that money together this year for that. Uh, I think we're going to have to look at this and really judge what progress has been made, what status is at, and come back to it uh, again uh, probably a number of times going forward. Um, let's see, some other things we did. Uh, there's a couple of new laws I'm just going to point out. Uh, one is there is a new law for the left-hand lane. If you're the slow driver in the left-hand lane, uh, there's now a $100 fine for, for being that driver. So. Um, uh, I see some happy folks about like that. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are actually the Washington Post and a few other uh, news outlets have done stories on that. And um, so I would I would encourage you if you're driving and you're at the speed limit or below, please don't stay in the left lane because you are subject to a $100 fine. But it's a safety issue as well because if people are in the left hand lane, which should be mainly for passing, uh, it does create sometimes people do crazy things to get around that that car. So uh, if we get people to move out of that pass lane and they're not passing. Uh, it'll be safe, and that was the intent of this. Uh, originally, this bill was put in with a $250 fine, and after a negotiation, went down to $100. It wouldn't surprise me if this is dealt with again in the future and even raised going forward. But it is law now, and this became law July 1st. Uh, suspended license. Uh, there Previously, it was unclear in the code uh, if you had a suspended or revoked license in the period of suspension. Uh, whether it would be run concurrently, which both if there was two suspensions, if the time would count at the same time, or if they had to be uh, 
run separately. So a lot of judges were treating it differently. So fortunately, we passed a law this year which clarified that, and now they're allowed to run concurrently. So if someone has a suspended or revoked license, really what we're trying to do is it's hard to have a job and to, to, be, um, to really uh, be a contributing member of society, particularly for those who run into trouble and are trying to get their lives straight if you don't have a driver's license. You need to get back and forth to work. So what we're trying to do is obviously not be light on these situations, but make sure that people do have a good road and we don't unnecessarily make it diff more difficult for people to get back to productivity. Um, let's see, other ones on my list. And you'll have to excuse me for looking at my list, but uh, I don't want to forget anything. Um, firearms. Uh, we actually had some bipartisan support of this. I sat on the Militia, Police, and Public Safety Committee, and I'm on the Guns Subcommittee. And uh, we look at all issues with guns. And one of the things that we did this year is we, it was a bipartisan uh, support for this, is anyone who does a concealed carry permit is required to provide photo ID with their application. In the past, that wasn't required. It was a little sketchy on that. So that's a requirement now. And I'm really glad that that, that is there. I mean, if we look at the other things we provide IDs for when we vote or when we get a driver's license, uh, I think concealed carry permit should be there as well. Uh, the other thing, and this was a lot of debate, but we did agree to allow s school security officers to carry a firearm in the performance of their duty. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, this one was a tough one for me. Uh, I did vote in favor of that after talking with Loudoun County uh, School Board, uh, and they asked me to vote in favor of that. I spoke with Prince William as well. And uh, there are stipulations that most people who are in that position are retired law enforcement officers. Uh, we, the last year this bill came up, and I voted against it then. And the reason why I voted against it is because it didn't have a training stipulation in it, and it also didn't have a physical test associated with that, because certainly I respect someone to do that job if they were a retired law enforcement officer, but we need to make sure their training is current, their vision is good, other things that go with it. So uh, this law does include those provisions, which I think now it's a pretty good law. Uh, let's see, marijuana possession. Previously, a person lost their driver's license for six months when they were convicted of a simple possession of marijuana. Now drivers, uh, license can, can, they can keep their license and they often perform 50 hours of community service. So I think this is a good step towards decriminalizing marijuana and really looking at that in a way that it makes Virginia more in line with many other states and also doing frankly, something that makes sense. Because what we were doing before, revoking the license, even if marijuana had nothing to do with driving, uh, didn't make a lot of sense in many cases. And I think that's it for my list. My, my bills, actually I'm going to start with um, some ABC stuff, so alcohol, alcoholic beverage control. Um, we govern that in the General Assembly. We oversee those, um, those regulations. Um, and there was a bill that came through, and I'm on that committee, that made me scratch my head because I don't know why, I didn't know why it was needed in Virginia. It was really designed, it's, it creates a new uh, level of permittee uh, for commercial lifestyle centers, okay? So we all are familiar with places like One Loudon, these live, work, play kind of communities where it has mixed use and it's all um, one, uh, one, develop, one big development. So One Loudon is an example of that. Um, the uh, Loud Station would be another example of that. Uh, I think Cascades Overlook would probably fit the, the, the definition. Um, this is kind of the, the nature of new development in Loudoun County. And these developers came to the General Assembly because they wanted a new kind of alcoholic beverage permit that would allow the restaurants on the premises, uh, the restaurants who, who had locations within the development, to sell alcoholic beverages in to-go cups, okay? So that people, instead of having to drink their alcoholic beverages with their meals uh, at the restaurant, could take it with them and wander around the lifestyle center continuing to shop or do whatever it was that they were going to do. Now, I didn't like this because, you know, in my, my background, I, I was a prosecutor and I know that this is the sort of thing that could create a slippery slope to underage drinking and drinking and driving, and I just didn't see the need for it. So I, I came out against it. I was in the minority. <laughs> um, it did pass, and uh, so, Starting very soon, you may be able to go to um, you know one of the restaurants, Uncle Julio's in in uh, One Loudon, and buy yourself a margarita and walk around the premises with it. So 
Um, that's, that's one of the laws that came through the ABC committee and the General Assembly this year. Um, social services, daycares, uh, issues with daycares. This is something that's very important to me. I've done a lot with um, kids in daycares and kids who've been abused and neglected or seen a lot as a prosecutor about you know, bad consequences that can happen when people who shouldn't be working in daycares are working in daycares. And in Virginia, we only had name-based uh, background checks. Even for, not, not everybody would require a, a background check to work with kids in daycares. But it was only name-based. And people were slipping through the cracks and using fake names or aliases. And uh, there were instances of kids, even one um, child who was, who was killed in the Richmond area. So uh, this bill, which I patron and which, which passed through the General Assembly, not without, some, um, not without some controversy, strangely enough, will require that fingerprint-based background checks be performed on um, employees of these, of these daycares. I would note that this was also, it wasn't only good policy and something that was important to do, um, it was required uh, as a condition of federal block grant funds that Virginia receives for, uh, for certain daycares. So we were gonna lose millions of dollars if we didn't do this. Uh, it was still, for whatever reason, somewhat controversial, but thankfully it did pass. Um, although it's got a reenactment clause on it, so we're gonna have to bring that back next year and do it again. We did have some positive um, legislation for victims' rights this year. Uh, you may have heard of PERC kits, physical ev evidence recovery kits. Uh, they are the, um, the forensic uh, evidence gathering that happens at the hospital when there's a sexual assault nurse examination, examination, things like that. And in Virginia, we had hundreds of these kits just gathering dust, never been tested. Um, so. You know, that, that even though we've had great advances in DNA uh, technology and it's easy to, to do those tests, we finally got some money to test those kits, so that's proceeding, and they're getting hits on cold cases now. Um, but a new uh, piece of legislation that passed this year will require that victims in sexual assault cases where that physical evidence is taken be notified of their right to have that um, to have the kit tested and to be notified before the kit is destroyed um, and that required that it be retained. Um, we also found that you know, sometimes these, these kits were being destroyed, never having been tested, and these victims never got closure. So that is, that is encouraging. A bill that I carried actually um, was a result of a case that was um, that w where one of my constituents had been a victim of an assault, uh, a sexual assault in, um, in Loudoun County. And she discovered that there are, you, you may have heard of revenge porn, right? Has anybody heard of this? So we made this, it, there's, there's two parts to it. There's con, when, when images are taken without consent or with consent, with the ones where they're taken with consent, when it's disseminated without the agreement or the, you know, the consent of the person in the photographs, um, we did create a criminal cause of action for doing that. Also, when there are images that are taken without the person's consent, and these are all images that are you know, of, of nudity and of, of private stuff, um, if, if those images are taken without the person's consent, the person, the, they can be uh, prosecuted as well, but there was no civil cause of action for either of these, uh, of these instances. So if the people were not prosecuted criminally, there was no cause of action for the victims. There was no way for the victims to seek uh, redress for what they had suffered. So um, I, I brought legislation to create a civil cause of action that would allow those victims to sue the perpetrators. And it was very well received um, in, in the General Assembly. Um, and actually the House Courts of Justice Committee, which is usually uh, very, very tough on these sorts of things, really liked the bill and added an attorney's fees provision and some other things to make it easier for victims to go after their perpetrators. Because you know the, the, com the prosecutor's office may or may not prosecute, but if you start you know 
get hitting a couple of these guys in their pocketbook, then they're gonna they're, they're gonna there's gonna be a deterrent effect, and that's really what we want to do is to protect these victims. The heroin and opioid crisis in Virginia. Um, this is something that affects you know thousands and thousands of Virginians, and unfortunately, despite all the steps that we've taken, it, it's getting worse. Uh, every day. It's getting wet worse before it gets better. Um, this year we had a bunch of bills that um, dealt with it. I had two, which um, one of which was co-patroned by delegate, um, Delegates Bell and Boisco. One, we had increases access, access to naloxone. Naloxone is Narcan. It's that opioid antagonist, the opioid reversal drug um, that immediately puts people um, into opioid reversal and can bring them back and revive them when they're suffering an overdose. So life-saving drug. Goal is to get it into the hands of as many people and we had faced certain administrative and regulatory burdens and hurdles that would prevent that from happening. So we actually convened a stakeholders group, um, found out what the problems, you know, what, what needed to be changed and thankfully we had the, the will of the administration. The governor's office was behind us. They were willing to fast track everything and we managed to change the law so that the uh, lay people, so when their people are trained in how to use naloxone, they can also dispense the life-saving drug at that time, rather than require people to take that extra step of going to a pharmacy and filling their, filling their um, order. So that will be very helpful and will help save lives. Um, another bill I carried ha had to do with substance-exposed newborns. Um, this is something that, unfortunately, we're seeing big jumps in the babies that are born substance exposed in Virginia. I think it was a 21% jump in the past year. And due to, you know, kind of a well-intentioned, but ultimately with, with um, detrimental side effects, uh, part of our, our law, Child Protective Services, if the mother had, the mother of that baby had sought treatment at any time during her pregnancy, um, when if the baby was born substance exposed, CPS couldn't get involved. They had to close their case. The other problem that we had was that the law provided only that cases where it was a non-prescribed substance that was being abused. So we had a lot of people who, you know, had been pill shopping and getting prescriptions all around the Commonwealth, but they were prescribed. So CPS couldn't do anything in those cases either. Um, so we had to, to deal with those, um, you know, close those loopholes. And the goal of this legislation, this is another one that experienced some controversy, I think, until we all, you know, everybody realized that there were no nefarious motives here, um, is to get services to these moms and their babies. Uh, because there is definitely a, uh, a philosophy among the treatment uh, providers among the social service providers, social services, child protect protective services, that you want moms and babies to stay, uh, to stay together, to be, you know, to have that time um, together right after the baby is born, because that is critical bonding for both of them, and there is never a time that mom is going to be more motivated to stay clean than when her baby's just been born. So this, the goal of this legislation and what it will ultimately do is enable us to provide more services to those moms and babies. So I'm very pleased about, about this legislation. Um, Virginia is initiating a needle exchange program, which is remarkable. Um, it is a limited program in, I think, Southwest Virginia area, um, and it is in places where there has been uh, a marked increase in hepatitis or AIDS cases um, as a result of needle sharing. But the mere fact that we're, you know, that people have, have taken notice and are willing to do this, to initiate this program is very, I think, a very positive step. It's, it's unfortunate that it's necessary, but we all, you know, are hoping to save lives here. And finally, uh, by 2020, we need to make uh, all opioid uh, prescriptions are gonna have to be tracked electronically in the prescription monitoring system. This has been a years long process that you know, physicians will be able to access uh, prescription records for controlled substances for their patients. 
and it's taken many years to make this happen because it's expensive and you know it can be burdensome on doctors to have to to in, to get this new technology and get it up and running but now um, basically everybody's pretty much on board the pharmacies uh, the physicians and everybody now it's it's a pretty normal uh, way of doing business so everything should be tracked electronically by 2020. finally um, another bill that i'm very proud of has to do with starting to segue into schools i guess um, is the alternatives to suspension and the school prison pipeline. So Virginia, in Virginia, very sadly, we have fantastic public schools, but unfortunately, we suspend and refer our kids to criminal justice system out of our schools at a higher rate than, um, than other states do. And I think that's a problem, especially because it disproportionately impacts uh, minority and disabled students. So there have been various moves, the various uh, bills coming forward to, to help deal with that, to help give school systems greater uh, flexibility, greater options. And thankfully, this year, with bi I mean, everything that we pass is bipartisan. With bipartisan support, um, our bill passed, which, which provides alternatives to suspension to school, to school systems, things like uh, positive behavior interventions, you know, uh, mediation, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, community service, alternatives to suspension, uh, and helps prioritize those for the school boards. So, you know, in Loudoun, we've, we've been dealing with this at the, at our, in the Loudoun schools um, for years. We've kind of been ahead of the curve in the rest of the Commonwealth, but uh, we're kind of gonna help, help share with the rest of com the Commonwealth what we've learned here in Loudoun and hopefully um, get the same good results that we've had here. So now, I would like to hand the mic over to Delegate Boisco. Thank you, so I'm gonna continue talking about our education system. We were able to make some progress in, in certain areas you've already heard that we were able to give our teachers uh, a small raise. It's still not enough, but it's, it's something and I'm very proud that we made that a priority this year. Um, we also did some things really that, that don't deal with the classroom as much, but deal with how we're um, equipping our, ch our children to handle life outside of the classroom. Um, one of the things was with bullying. You know, we all know that kids are bullied in school and it, it sometimes reaches a level that ends up with a child harming themselves or having really mental anguish over it. And so we passed a bill this year that would have uh, required, and this also was a little bit controversial actually in the House of Delegates, that would require that the school let the parent know that something had taken place. So not only would it let the, the victim of, of such a child know, but also the perpetrator, so that they could have those conversations at home at their dinner table to say, something's not right here, let's talk about it, to try to head it off before it becomes a massive problem. And I think that was a great step in the right direction because we want parents to be empowered and we want them to know what's going on at school. We also um, did, uh, you know, with the Black Lives Matter and police uh, brutality issue, some, sometimes, um, especially teenagers, don't feel like they're equipped to know how to handle a simple traffic stop and um, so they, they don't know how to respond to the policeman. They don't know what the protocol should be. So we've actually decided to incorporate that into our driver's education system so that kids understand. You put your hands on the wheel. You say, yes, sir. You say, I'm going to be reaching for my driver's license right now, sir. Um, and so that it, it goes more smoothly, so that everybody feels like they know what the rules are. And then the police will know that the kids are trained and understand what those rules are. So we feel like it's a win-win situation for everyone. We also worked on um, talking about um, another aspect, which is consent. And then by consent, I'm talking about sexual behavior. So in our family life education, which families have the opportunity to opt in or opt out of, we're, we're going to have a portion of that where boys and girls have a conversation about what no means and what yes means, so that hopefully we will reduce the incidence of sexual assault or uh, accusation of sexual assault. So everybody, again, understands 
what's appropriate behavior and what's not appropriate behavior that we all agree on. So those are, those are three education things that really don't have to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic, but I think can make a big difference. Another thing that we did was we're empowering the, the State Board of uh, Education to have more oversight on our student-teacher ratios, which has been a problem, especially here in Northern Virginia, um, to, to make sure that, that they have more say over that so that we are not having overcrowded classrooms. I will let you know that we, again, try to get full-day kindergarten all throughout the state, and unfortunately, uh, we could not get enough of our colleagues to go along with that but um, we will continue working on that issue. In higher education, college, I know that affordability is a huge issue for everyone who is looking at uh, you know, higher education for their kids. This year, we uh, passed a bill that would say that tuition at our public universities and college cannot be increased without first providing the public and the, the public school uh, students with a projected range of the planned increases and an explanation of the need for those increases. And with that would have to be a notice of the date and the location of any vote on the increase 30 days prior to that vote. Again, giving families and stakeholders a voice in this instead of just receiving a bill that says, by the way, we're up another 10%. So we think that that's empowering our families a little bit more and making more uh, uh, transparency, which I think is a great idea. We also, uh, passed a bill that would crack down on for-profit colleges who take advantage of our students and veterans. And, and Delegate Kathleen Murphy, who uh, represents a portion of Loudoun County, was the sponsor of this bill. It would say that they had to provide it a document before you go in to pay your tuition, um, that it was a for-profit college and whether or not it was accredited. So again, another piece of transparency so that buyer beware has the best um, information. And I also have notes, so I just want to make sure that I've got it right. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, the environment now. Um, in the city of Alexandria, which is 400 plus years old, it's, it's, um, its sewage system is very much out of date. And other cities that have similar out of date systems have been required to go in and mitigate so that raw sewage is not going into the Potomac or other rivers, and that's what's been going on right now. And this was, again, a really controversial bill, and it was a difficult one because the locality, the city of Alexandria, said, wait a second, we don't have the, we don't have the resources to make these changes yet, but because we felt like the, um, the environmental impact was something that we really need to be taking um, into account, and, and it's, you know, affecting our water system, we uh, passed a law that would require the city of Alexandria's sewage overflow plot problem to comply with Virginia Department of Environmental Quality guidelines and the Clean Water Act by the year of 2025. And um, you know, hopefully that's going to move things forward and we're going to get uh, that on board sooner rather than later. It's a huge cost to the city. Um, but we just can't, we can't keep kicking the can down the road. And so I, I voted for it and I, I think it was the right thing to do even though it was a difficulty. And I usually do come down on the side of a municipality because I, I sit on the County Cities and Towns Committee and um, I understand, I, I, I used to work for Fairfax County so I understand some of the, the challenges that they face. We also have other um, rules concerning coal ash disposal, another thing that Many environmentalists are very, very passionate about making sure that we're protecting our waterways from coal ash. And so, once again, we are upping the requirement and making sure that, you know, the big energy companies comply with it. And they, they have said they are going to be full on board and they're going to do everything that they can to, to make sure that that is, uh, is done. I spend a lot of my effort in the House of Delegates on um, issues dealing with women's health care. And I was really pleased to say that this year, for the first time, this bill has been um, introduced year after year without being passed. This time, almost unanimously, we passed a bill that will be able to uh, have a 12-month supply of contraception um, rather than only 90 days at a time. And I can't believe that that's a controversial issue, but 
Um, it has been for several years, but we got it through this year. Delegate Eileen Fillercorn was the, the sponsor of that bill, and I'm really pleased that she was able to get that through. And um, on a less positive note, we all are supporters of expanding access to health care in general. And once again, we tried to get a vote on Medicaid, and once again, it failed. So let's just go over the details again. The federal government requires that we pay a tax, all of us. It's now going $5 million per day to other states because we are not willing to pass Medicaid expansion right here in Virginia. So we are giving up the opportunity to help 400,000 Virginians. And in fact, on Friday, I'm gonna be driving down to Wise County where there will be thousands of people lining up at the fairground for their one chance a year to see a doctor and a dentist. And Governor McAuliffe has done this in the past. He said, for those who are going to see the dentist quite often, they're just buckets and they just want to have their teeth removed completely because in their minds, teeth means pain and they'd rather be without it than, than uh, without teeth than to have that pain. So um, my aide and I are gonna be driving down on Friday. We're gonna get up at 4 a.m. and um, work until 5 p.m. doing whatever they need our help with. But again, Medicaid expansion, I, I think we should all be ashamed that Virginia has not uh, done that and it's been a huge waste of our tax dollars going to other states. So, just an FYI, everybody in this. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is I sit on the Privileges and Elections Committee and the hottest topic, the thing that I heard the most from my constituents with this year was on uh, gerrymandering and redistricting. And sitting in that committee is unlike anything I've ever seen. Common sense, no nonsense proposals were, were raised, whether it was that we should just have a panel of, of delegates and um, others from the community to look at how we look at creating our uh, political districts, you know, in the state. Um, we believe that the voters should choose their elected official, not the elected officials choosing the voters, which is the case right now. So we had these committee hearings and there were hundred, more than 100 people in the audience. And one of, one of my colleagues tried to raise just getting an actual vote in the committee to say, should we consider any of these proposals for changing the way we do districts in the state or not? And they suspended the meeting rather than take a vote on it. So not only did they not vote for or against, but they just quit the meeting and then scurried out of the room like mice with their heads down. And there were people in the audience and they stood up and they said, shame on you, this is your job, do your job. And once again, I've heard more about that from my constituents than any other issue. It's something that I'm gonna continue to work to push forward. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. It's common sense. It's not a partisan issue, and we should all be brave and be willing to take a vote on that, if nothing more. Nobody seemed to want to go on the record for that. The last thing that I want to talk about is cats and dogs and lifetime licenses are now going to be available. <laughs> so, people love animal bills. It's very <laughs> exciting. Oh, no, they didn't like mine. <laughs> This law will authorize a governing body or county or city to provide for a lifetime license for a dog or a cat. So everybody can go for the one time only. You don't have to go every five years anymore and get your pet's license so that we all know that they're safe and, and being taken care of. So that's the end of our official portion of the legislative update. What I'm excited to do is hear from you all about what's important to you because remember we work for you not the other way around oh yes and i think i question you don't have any last words just if you just tell everybody highlights. that they didn't show up the session highlights we have. over there in the uh, session highlights are over here if anyone wants to grab those as they leave my uh, intern emily has them right there she'll take them over to you if you want yep 
Uh, real quick, I just wanted to add a couple things on the opioids if I can. Uh, this is a, a personal issue for me, and I've, I've shared my son's story at his urging. Uh, he's struggling with opioid addiction, and uh, he's, doing, he's doing well today. He's working, and uh, he's on the right path, but it's been a, a really hard journey. Uh, this is a hard journey for, for everybody. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I was pretty involved in uh, a lot of the bills that they went through this year. There were 15 bills that came out of the General Assembly. Uh, Senator Wexon talked very articulately about a number of them. There are a couple others that I think could have a major impact. Uh, one is limiting the number of opioid pills that could be given out on an acute pain prescription the first time at the emergency room. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my son actually, when he walked out of the emergency room, he had a 90-day prescription. He was injured in a car accident and hurt his neck with five refills. Oh. This is a tremendous amount of opioid pills. And before he was done with that prescription, he was already addicted. And uh, we didn't learn about his addiction until about seven years later. Uh, frankly, he lives in Texas. We weren't around him but a few times a year. There were some things that were weird at the time. We didn't know what they were. And later we found out it was because he was withdrawing. He was ill after about three days on a vacation. So uh, what we want to do, and actually I talked to the Medical Society of Virginia, uh, worked with a number of, uh, of delegates, Republicans and Democrats, to try to get this through. We start off with three days on the bill, only three days of prescriptions, uh, and that's actually what the Center for Disease Control recommends, because uh, there are actually a number of commonly prescribed opioids after five or seven days of, of taking the pill, you can be about 50% chance of being addicted and having withdrawals. So uh, based on that, uh, we negotiated, we went to 14 days, uh, and I can tell you several emergency room doctors called me up uh, during this process and said, please, please pass this because we're getting harassed and threatened in the emergency room. People withdrawing are coming in there to get prescriptions. So uh, this is a big deal. Uh, I think we'll have to monitor this, and I think this is another one we're gonna have to come back to as well. Uh, and, and she spoke about the Narcon shot, the naloxone drug. Uh, uh, two very important things in that. One, if you uh, have someone who's suffering from addiction, well, I hope they get into treatment and recovery quickly, uh, it's probably not a bad practice to have that same shot around. And you can go to a pharmacist now without a prescription and get that, that um, same shot. Uh, if it's administered within the first 30 minutes, as an outstanding chance of reversing overdose. Uh, we provided $2.4 million this year to make sure that all of uh, the first responders throughout Virginia have that. Many of our communities just didn't have the money to buy it for the first responders. And in rural areas where it might be 20, 30 minutes before someone get it, can get on the scene, there's not enough time to wait to put the person to the hospital or get someone else there. The first person on the scene needs to have that life-saving drug. So we'll, we'll make sure that that happens. In the first weeks, it was deployed in several counties. There were two saves in Fauquier County. There were a couple saves in Loudoun County. It's only partially deployed. It's already making a big difference. Uh, again, I hope we get to a point where we don't have the kind of addiction problem we have today, but this is part of it because if we can save a life and we know there's an overdose, that's a triggering event that can lead to get them into treatment and can help on that. So that's a big deal. The other thing we did is in treatment for um, substance abuse, often with people, they suffer from terrible withdrawal symptoms and they have cravings and they're very strong. And this is where it becomes a disease because it's not just I'm gonna gut this out, it's, it's just too strong for them to gut it out. They need treatment. And there are two commonly prescribed drugs for that, actually three. There's one, a Vivitrol shot, which uh, I understand is very effective, but it's very expensive. It's about $1,400 a shot. There's a, a drug called Subutex and another one called Suboxone. Uh, and the Subutex will, will keep uh, the symptoms of withdrawal down, but it will not prevent uh, the effects of opioids. So if someone takes that and they take opioids, they can still get high, they can still uh, relapse. The other drug, Suboxone, which I'll, I'll say my son is taking very successfully, uh, if you take that, it suppresses opioids. So if you take an opioid, it will have no impact on you. Uh, as the doctor told me with my son, you can take enough opioids to kill an elephant, it wouldn't impact you at all. So uh, what we've done is uh, unless there's a medical exemption or case of pregnancy on that prescription has to be Suboxone now, not Subutex, because there are many instances where people were taking Subutex and still abusing opioids at the same time. So this is another step to try to make sure uh, that the drug is slightly more expensive but it, it has a much stronger impact of keeping people off of opioids. Uh, these uh, pieces of legislation, I think, again, they're all works in progress. I don't think these are the finished, uh, uh, this is not the finished product. Uh, we're gonna have to study these, and there's probably gonna be more things required in future years. Uh, some of the things I like to see is prescriptions, uh, level one prescriptions, meaning that most insurance will cover it. 
for non-addictive drugs for people who are in opioid addiction recovery. Because if you have an accident, break your leg, it, it's really difficult then, you, you need pain medicine, but you only get something that you were previously addicted to, or you might be right back in the addiction again. But right now, those drugs uh, are very expensive and difficult for doctors to prescribe. So I think we need to give a pathway to make that a little bit easier. Uh, but again, many other things I would invite, please give us feedback on this issue. Tell us things you're seeing and hearing so we can try to respond to it because this is an ongoing crisis. It's every income area, it's every ethnic group, it's the biggest, smallest cities in Virginia, it's everywhere. So uh, we, we really need to all hands on deck to fight this, uh, to try to, to turn this tide around. Anything you want to add? Okay, so we're ready for questions. Jacqueline is going to uh, bring the mic to you so we can all hear your questions. And Jaffa Imam of Israel. You know that young lady, 17 years old, Nabra, was killed on Greenville Road. And Shafas County Police spokesperson said that was not a hate crime. But some of the other people in Adams, they were just discussing that this might be a hate crime. What I want that if you can work in the assembly, that how could you find in a way detail in depth that was it a hate crime or was it a hate that Spanish guy killed uh, and that Nabla? Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to say a murder charge is a murder charge and you know, if he's convicted of murder, he's going to prison for the rest of his life. So. That's what's most important to me. I, I understand the sensitivity of the community and you know that I'm, I am very much standing up every single day to say, you know, hate has no home here. Um, what I wanna make sure is that justice is served for him. Um, I'm not sure what more they would be able to do than send him to prison for the rest of his life. Um, so I don't know if Jennifer is up. Well, there, there already are, um, there already are uh, enhancements in terms of punishment for um, for criminal acts that are where the victim is selected on the basis of their of their of their race or their religion. So I think um, now I, I I don't think that they have gone um, necessarily into the homicide statutes, um, but that is something that is that is clearly an enhancement in terms of the penalty. Um, both in terms of, you know, from a misdemeanor to a felony and, and enhancing the punishment that, that people would receive. Um, so that, that is something that has been dealt with. Real quickly, um, this obviously is a terrible tragedy. Uh, I mean, it speaks just, I, I mean, I, words can't express, and frankly, uh, you know, I try to, to think how could someone do a barbaric act like that? I can't come to any logical conclusion because there's no logic to it. It's just awful. And it, it doesn't represent what our community represents. Uh, I know the three of us were over there the, the morning after this happened and at the, the funeral for Nabra. Uh, I spoke with her father, I, I, and yeah, I think we all did. And you know, the pain the family and everyone is feeling is just awful. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, the Adams Center has been wonderful uh, in this response and has been very respectful. Let's, let's let the police do their investigation. I know the communication there has been good. Uh, my initial look on this uh, was that it did look like a hate crime. Uh, now the information that, that I'm, I'm hearing is there might be gang activity there. So one thing I'll say is I think we need to, to revolve, revive our gang task force. And, and I think it needs to be a Northern Virginia gang task force. Because I, uh, unfortunately in some of the gangs today, you can clap about that because we need to support that. Uh, because the gang task force, I mean, can, you know, our officers are, are so strapped with just taking care of the business that they have, they can't focus on this emerging problem the way it needs to be addressed. And the, uh, unfortunately, the sickness in the gangs, if you murder someone, that's a way to move up in the ranks. That's how sick this is. So, um, and, and there may be indication that's what it is, but we need to find out more information about that. Uh, but it is a tragedy. It does not speak for our community. Uh, the last thing I want to say is, Whenever a hateful remark is made against any group, we need to all stand up against them, all of us. And, and this is you know, something that we've had a few faith over fear events this year at the Adams Center, I went to one of the Durga Temple, a few other places. 
but it's not just one ethnic community or one group that's targeted. When anybody says that, hateful markets, it's all of us. We are a diverse community, and our diversity is our strength. It's not our weakness. It's not something that we should just accept. It's something we need to celebrate. And if anybody does something like that, we all have to stand up against it. And Nabra, I, I think the number, you know, thousands of people who went to her funeral or memorial just shows how committed we are to that because that's not what we're about. And that's not what we stand for. I do want to touch on the gang issue, though, very, very briefly, because that is something that in Northern Virginia that has been a problem um, in the past and back in the you know late um, aughts, or, you know the the two thousand seven, eight, nine, mid mid two thousands. Um, we we were very at the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office was very active with their with their gang unit and with the Northern Virginia Regional Gang Task Force and those those you know. The, the being so active and all of those actions paid off um, because they did, um, you know, ma manage to to s put a, a large stop on the gang violence. It was also, you know, very active with the SROs in the schools and everything. Um, but then, as often happens, when they say, "Okay, well, now we don't have a problem anymore. We've solved it," um, there that has not been a priority of late, and so. They have come back with a vengeance, and you know, even in in Lansdowne, in my district, a very nice uh, neighborhood, there's there's gang graffiti um, that you can find in certain public spaces. So it's they're, they're coming back, and something needs to be done. I, I agree with John on this. I agree with you. We need rehab and we need detox centers. I've actually met with Inova and, and, uh, and I've actually got a meeting scheduled. I'm going over to Stone Springs Hospital to talk to HCA tomorrow and I've already talked to Nova and Health. They have a hospital. Uh, it's in Prince William, but it's in this area. I think we need detox and we need rehab. And I'm going to put a plug in here. Elise, stand up. She's going to be at the door. I'm actually on the board of this group, so I'm plugging her. I'm sorry for the embarrassment. Uh, this is actually for a group called Dandelion Meadow. And uh, she's at an event that they're going to have on uh, August 15th, uh, 5 to 8. And they're doing some fundraising now. Dandelion Meadows is trying to find a recovery home for women who are in addiction recovery. And that's something we don't have either. And for women, it's even harder than men when they go into recovery. So often women are in abusive relationships, and they don't have a place to live. And that feeds into the cycle of addiction that they can't get out of. So uh, thanks to Elise and everybody who's working this, I'm, I'm honored to be just a small part of that group. But uh, I agree, we need addiction treatment, we need detox. Uh, I, there's some programs in Massachusetts that uh, I've, I've learned about where, uh, and I've talked to Sheriff Chapman about this, and he's very supportive. We can find a way that the vision I would like to have is um, that when someone is addicted and they're ready for treatment, that they pick up the phone and they call 911 and they ask for help. The sheriff picks them up, confiscate, destroys drugs, don't press charges, takes them door to door to treatment. Because that they have it in, in Worcester, Massachusetts and a few other places, fantastic success rates. And any money that we have to spend on these, it's gonna come back to us because we can return people to be productive citizens. Uh, so I think it's, it's critical for us. And I know uh, our sheriffs, they, they tell me about half of the calls they're making right now are addiction related. And they know many of the people that they're seeing, uh, they need treatment. And, and that right now we don't have enough options for that. So I agree with you 100%, sir. I just want to tell you about what's going on in Fairfax County. I agree with everything that, that John has said. Um, the sheriffs and the sheriff's department and the, uh, the CBS, the CB Community Services Board, I, I never get my acronyms right, um, have worked together to, to do a diversion first model in Fairfax County. My A is actually at the meeting tonight with stakeholders from the police department, sheriff's department, all the mental health folks, the people from the Board of Supervisors. So what happens is somebody's acting a little bit weird on the street. They're not doing a big crime. It might be that they're sitting on a watermelon at the grocery store or sitting in the middle of the street. They, the police, instead of taking them to the jail, can take them, divert them over to the, the um, mental health center where they can get a screening to see, okay, what's going on? And then we're keeping, I think over the past year, 
um, we have diverted over 300 people from being put in incarceration, which I think is a great step forward. It's a model that everybody in, Fairfax, in the, the, the Commonwealth should be using, but it just takes coordination and collaboration, which I think we have, we have the will, don't we? So um, just another way of trying to help but keep that down. Fairfax yes, sir. County, You have five days of Cornwall and you're out. That's it. And that's not enough. No, that's you need a twenty eight day yes. program here in Loudoun County. Yeah. Well You're I gonna have to change the subject to get me to disagree with you. Yeah, I I agree with you completely, one hundred percent. I would just add that, you know, a part of that is we have foregone expanding Medicaid and we have foregone, you know, giving the people the opportunity to have coverage for these for substance use disorder and for addiction treatment that, that they would have under the Affordable Care Act because of the parity aspect of it. And these, these entities, you know, they need to, um, you know, their, their businesses or even if they're nonprofits, they can't operate, you know, without some sort of revenue, uh, guaranteed revenue or, or revenue. So, so that's another issue that we have here in Latin County. Thank you. Um, I just want to piggyback on that. Um, we've been talking a lot about opioids and addictions, and that is incredibly important. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I have many friends who have deal with that firsthand or in their families. But there's also something called dual diagnosis, um, and we are woefully lacking in terms of all mental health um, resources and facilities not even just rehab. And part of the problem, and I also have a personal story about this, um, is it's actually a jail now that's really acting as our mental health center. And uh, so to me, this is one of the highest problems that's out there. I even think it's related to gun safety, so. And that's when I was talking about the diversion first, is mental health, um, people who should, who should have mental health treatment and drug and alcohol abuse. So. They're trying to approach it through but diverge. Just from your number 300, it's not enough. That's, like that's just touching the. 0.1 I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, for those who may not know, the dual diagnosis, and this is something I learned with my son, and we fortunately had uh, families that we met in our experience who helped coach us on this. Uh, when someone goes for uh, drug treatment uh, in an inpatient facility, uh, the dual diagnosis, one would be for the addiction, and the other would be for the condition that may have led or caused the addiction because a high percentage of people uh, who have addictive behaviors also have a, an undiagnosed mental illness or something else going on and they're probably trying to self-medicate that. So, uh, so the dual diagnosis is very important uh, and, and if you do have people, you know, I would recommend uh, reaching out to those who may have experienced this. If you have friends, friends or family, if you Dr. Ben, have to experience this yourself, uh, to know what is a good facility, what isn't. And this is something that, frankly, legislative, I think we should work on because many people will send their children to these facilities and not realize they're not dual diagnosis facilities and think that their facility, you know, really offers what the person needs and they may not. There, there's really none in Virginia. Uh, there actually are, there are, yeah, Galax, Virginia has one. It's about 300 miles from here and I think there's another one. Um, at least over, can you help me? Was there one out in, uh, it was out west by Winchester. I think that's a dual diagnosis facility as well. Uh, so I think there's at least there's there's several, but there's not nearly enough. Uh, Phoenix House has a great after program, but that's only for Arlington residents. Uh, so it's really it's really restrictive. Uh, please, McShen. Yes, uh, that's right. McShen is in Richmond. That's probably the largest dual diagnosis in Virginia. It's a nonprofit, and they actually have long-term residency. They're very successful. Uh, the issue with McShen, though, uh, they don't take any insurance at all. Uh, and they do keep their costs very low, but for many people, it's not an option. So the, what I'm appealing to is Inova and some of the nonprofits to really step up because we need more options for people. And again, when someone's in crisis and they're ready to go to treatment, we've got to get them to treatment. Speaking of uh, privileges and elections, uh, I know uh, President's Voting Commission requisite for states' voting records and I do realize that uh, Virginia turned that down, Governor McCullough turned it down. And I, 
I do also recall that, realize that uh, some of the states did turn in the records. I just I was just looking for any you know from a general assembly perspective if you guys had any comments on that or insights on that. I'm not sure. about the president's request for all of our voting information. That's very personal information, um, and I support Governor McAuliffe's decision not to turn it over. Um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I'm not gonna speculate any further. One thing that's worth um, noting is that in Virginia, we don't register to vote by political party. And that's a wonderful thing about Virginia. There have been legislative efforts to change that, um, and and you know put labels on people and have make people just make people register uh, as a, a, a Republican or a Democrat or an independent but in, if they register as an independent then they can't vote in any primary um, so that that's something that that is something that I like about Virginia that we are independents and I can I can attest to the fact that and I, I would imagine the delegates agree with me um, that we're when we're out knocking on doors um, just Almost everybody that we talk to says, I'm an independent. I consider myself an independent. I'm a registered independent. I was like, well, of course you are. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, so that's something I think that, that is nice about Virginia, and I would not want to see that change. I want to thank you so much uh, for being here for all of us to see and meet you. And I'm very impressed, and I know you work and work and work when you're down here, you have a thousand bills or something. Well, I have one here that I know you voted on, and I just want to ask you if you would please think about supporting it. That's a convention for states, convention of states. In other words, every, there are already like 18 states have approved this. In fact, my home state of Missouri just voted yet. And what this means, is that each state will vote about things that we would like us to go back to the Constitution. I would like limited length of time, constitutionally, the House of Representatives, two, two years, two times. The Senate, three years, two times. That takes all of this money, people out on the limb, because they can only buy the Senator or the representative for a very short period of time, and it's not worth them spending millions of dollars. And I think it gets us back to where we are supposed to be, uninfluenced by the finances and not having these huge, expensive elections that people, nobody can afford to be elected. You know, and then naturally somebody's gonna give you a few thousand dollars towards your election, then they're gonna call you up. You're certainly at least gonna have to listen to them. But it's gotten way past just listening over in, the, in our national government. And I think that we need to, when we all have it comes up again in the state, I'd like to know who's voting for it and who's not, because I wanna call everybody up who's not voting for a convention of state. And thank you for all that you do. I think we all agree that there's too much money in politics, um, and we wish we didn't have to call up people and, and ask them for money uh, in order to run for office. So um, there have been um, movements for a convention of states, um, but there doesn't not isn't necessarily a consistent um, philosophy that they're seeking with the amendments to the Constitution. And by that I mean we've had. Um, We've had uh, calls for a convention of states for a ballot, balanced budget amendment. We've had calls for a convention of state, states to curb executive overreach. Um, now there's there are movements for the um, to get the money out of politics, and some people have come and talked to me about that. Um, but they didn't have a term limit aspect to it, so I don't know. You know, keeping, I don't know whether the, that critical mass would necessarily um, be reached to get to that point. Um, it's also would be complicated about who the delegates would be um, because some states I think would, would, would have them selected by their 
you know, by the House of Delegates or something like that. And that obviously, when you have a gerrymandered uh, House of Delegates, it leads to a different result. So it's very complicated. I, I understand um, what you know what what you'd like to see, and I think I share <laughs> your concerns um, about money and politics and 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 even term limits, frankly, um, for that matter. But um, I don't know whether necessarily convention of states is, is the best way to go about it. Um, we can do things at the state level for ourselves, but nobody's willing to do that. I mean, the, the, uh, efforts to, to re reform our campaign finance system get killed every session. And I mean, I would love to see, you know, maximum set on campaign contributions in Virginia. There's no cap on, con on campaign contributions in Virginia. Somebody can give you a million dollars, and we believe in full disclosure, no limit. But uh, that doesn't always lend itself to the best form of governance in my mind. So. The other thing that I would add, Joyce, is um, dealing with our campaign finance. We've even tried to limit any expenditure that a political candidate has towards making them spend it on their campaigns specifically, we can't even get that out of the house. So right now, if I want to take everybody in the room on a Caribbean cruise with my campaign money, as long as I uh, record it, I could do that. <laughs> Pretty much for everybody. But I mean, we have, a, we have a long way to go in dealing with campaign finance reform and electoral reform. And, and I know, you know, when Bob McDonald, the former governor, got into trouble over ethics, um, what we have done now is that if we go to a reception and have a cocktail weenie, we basically have to, you know, report that and fill out a form for any kind of lunch or reception or you know, anything that's more than $50 of a limit, I believe, is the standing. Accrued, yeah, over and accrued. So if I go to three things that are $25, I have to report that, you know. So it's, 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 a, it's a can of worms, and we do need to address that, but I, I don't have that answer right now. If you have your hand up, we will get to you. Don't worry, everybody will get to everybody. Um, as a member of the League of Women Voters, um, I'm sure you all agree with the idea that voting should be easier. Would you please tell us why we can't get any bills out of the Privileges and Elections Committee that would do the simplest thing, like make people over 65 not have to have excuse absentee voting? Yeah. For that, and we can make it that out. Please explain. I think I know the answer, but maybe the rest of these people don't. Sure. So I serve on the Privileges and Elections Committee, and once I serve on the Privileges and Elections Committee in the House, and once again, it's mind blowing to see the common sense, pragmatic, practical solutions that people ask for, and they are denied because. There are certain people who like the process to be difficult and onersome and complex because that, that makes it harder for people who maybe have a harder time getting around or maybe don't have transportation solutions or maybe don't have an ID or um, might not have an easy name, come and vote. It's all about controlling who's voting. I believe that we should have an open and as easy as possible voting system, accessible to people, make sure that it's safe, which we, last year, I sat for six hours in committee with my colleagues in the Senate and the House, where they were, there were a certain group of people who were claiming that there was massive voter fraud in the state, and they sent around a report. I was able to say, because I had the information that the people that they had claimed were voting fraud, I was like, well, no, this person actually had the same name as this person over there, and the person you're talking about was not 
voter fraud. I, I could, I just, I just hammered him, and finally the guy just stopped trying because everything that he was claiming was fraudulent. I had an answer for it because we did our homework. That's not a major problem in Virginia. And the problem is that we are cutting off access to people's ability to vote. So people who are over 65 still have to come in unless they have, you know, in the list of 18 or so uh, reasons. Uh, we have to show an ID. They tried to have a, a, a bill that would make you, when you send your voter application, send a picture to the Board of Elections, but there's nobody in the Board of Elections who has your picture already. So <laughs> what would that have done, right? What we're not doing is funding our electoral boards efficiently, and so they're overworked and overtaxed, and they don't have enough time or talent or resources to actually uh, process all of these um, these uh, voter applications and absentee ballot uh, requirements in the, in the due time that we need. That's where the problem is. And also we need to make sure, because the federal government has been giving a lot of money to Virginia uh, through a grant, that grant is getting ready to expire, which means we need even more money from the state to make sure that our voting system is safe and reliable and equipment works. And that's where the problem is. It's not in, you know, whether or not grandpa can go vote uh, a month ahead or not. So you have an advocate in me on expanding voter access and making sure that it's safe, reliable, and accessible to everybody. So there's somebody in the back who has... Yeah, I have a line. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, Hi, I'm a member of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and I know recently in the news it was stated that um, convicted criminals have said that they come to Virginia from other states to get guns because it's so easy to access firearms in the state of Virginia. And I was wondering what we can do about that in the state and on a personal level, um, we as citizens could do, and also on the state level, if there's anything that you think we could do um, to curb that, I mean, it goes along with the talk of gangs and things like that, just the general safety of the population. So. Um, universal background checks are a great start for that. Um, another piece of legislation that we used to have here in Virginia and was repealed, I think, in 2012, um, was the one handgun a month law, um, which Virginia had been, you know, a top destination for gun traffickers, handgun traffickers, uh, up and down the 95 corridor. Um, people would come to Virginia, buy their guns in bulk, and then go distribute them in New York or wherever else, you know, they could fetch a better price. And uh, that after that was repealed, Guess what? Now there are you know big federal cases where Virginia's again the place where people you know the, the the defendants in that case were bragging that it's so easy to buy guns in Virginia, um, and that's just not you know that's not what we're trying to do. So universal background checks, vast majority of the NRA membership, um, vast majority of American you know Americans favor that, and for whatever reason you know even after Sandy Hook we could not get anything done in the General Assembly, and it's so disheartening. But I thank you for what you're doing. Um, keep it up, because we will get there. Yeah, I mean, on this issue, you know, frankly, we don't want to keep honest, law-abiding citizens from buying firearms. Uh, I'm a firearm owner. You know, I was in the military. I carried firearms and combat zones for six months on my hip. I sat on the gun subcommittee. But we do need to make sure that vendors uh, do background check and they check the ID because it should not be easier uh, to buy a gun than it is to vote. It shouldn't be uh, easier to buy a gun than it is to get a driver's license. And frankly, I think it's an embarrassment to Virginia uh, when we have the commissioner of police in Newark, New Jersey and New York City saying that the majority of guns confiscated from crime in those areas come from Virginia gun shows. Uh, I think, you know, they call it 95 the iron pipeline. And, and these things, I think, are really bad for us, and they, they reflect poorly on our state. This should not be the path of least resistance. But at the same time, you know, I respect the Second Amendment. When I bought a firearm, I got a background check. I showed my ID, and, they, and it only took a minute. It was very quick. It was very easy, and I'm happy to do that. 
Uh, I also believe uh, if you have a concealed carry permit, you should have in-person training. Uh, because right now you can do it online or video training. And I know the, uh, I've handled firearms and I've got extensive firearm training. And uh, before I was able to handle a firearm, you know, I, made the, I had the instructor watch me, make sure my holster was properly fitted, make sure that my safety procedures were good, and give me feedback on those things. If you don't have somebody watching you, you probably can't do that. So uh, I, this is to me about common sense. Uh, I think you know, if we're walking around in a mall and someone has a concealed weapon, I can't see that weapon. So I don't know if they're handling it properly. Uh, if I frankly rather have an open carry than that because then I at least know the weapon's being properly handled. But uh, I think that's where the training aspect comes in. And frankly, I've asked some of the, the gun groups to be part of that training. You know, I think it'd be a great way for them to get new members. Get the training, you know, help, help us with this because we have more people who are properly trained uh, on, on firearms. So uh, I think there's many things we can do on this, but uh, I think, you know, we're, we're gonna have to keep going. But I do believe that if we look at the paradigm we've used for the last 10, 15 years, it has not worked. We can do better. The final thing I want to say is smart gun technology is there. We just need to have it throughout the, the country. I mean, I don't think anyone wants their toddler to pick up a gun on the side of the bed. I mean, that, I'm kind of changing the subject a little bit, but the same thing with guns being stolen and shipped from around. We want to make sure that the person who's holding the gun is able and, and, and lawfully the person who should be having it, not a toddler, not a preschooler. We don't need any more of those um, horrible, horrible tragedies. We will get your question. Hi. I was wondering, um, going back to your voting issue, um, with this information, that you guys sometimes face in both chambers, and also it gets out to the public. Um, it is not just a statewide problem, it's now a national problem that is tearing our country apart in many areas. One of the things I was wondering if Virginia's Assembly and the Senate would consider as, uh, a bill that would change the aspect of how information is disseminated. I'm immediately looking at taking that information and having it verified before it even reaches a chamber or committee. And the same thing going out to the voters, the, all of us, um, before we see what's slinging on TV and all that sort of stuff, in other words, that information has to be verified. It cannot be something that somebody makes up and, and condemns another person or marginalizes an entire race of people or anybody else. That is one of the things that's, that we need to really look at quickly because right now, as, we're ta as I'm talking, we still have a, a different agents, groups of people who will do everything from taking a hate group and giving them facial recognition against the people who are rallying against them so that they control these people online. They, you can have people that um, are looking at a simple aspect of the law and try to twist it in such a way that it will marginalize what it really means. Any, ask, any uh, comments on that? I mean, this is something I'm kind of trying to put together and I need you, you guys help with this. Uh, I think you bring up a good point. You know, it's important to verify the, the source of news. And I know when people come to see me, I try to get multiple verifications of it. I think most people do the same thing. Uh, let me say a couple things, they may not directly answer your question, but I think it gets a point, maybe between us we can all get it. First off, we are accessible. We're here, when we're in Richmond, come and see us. Come down there and talk to uh, elected officials about what you believe in and bills that are, that are being looked at at that session. Talk to people from both parties and tell them why you believe what you believe and, and help you know, your, bring your knowledge to the table about that issue. Because uh, every, every day we're in session, I usually 
see a number of different people. Some days, uh, particularly like Martin Luther King Day, it's a big uh, 3,000 people usually come down to lobby, and you know we'll see uh, each legislator might see six or eight different groups of 30 people uh, in and out of, when we're not in session. So, and, and each one of those groups, you know, has information to share about what their point is. And I, I like to talk to people, regardless of where I'm at on an issue, I want to hear all sides of it. So I want to hear everybody uh, on that issue so I can make sure that, that I'm making the right decision. Uh, there's another great thing that happened this past year, and I hope it will continue, uh, is there's a website called eyesonrichmond.com. Uh, and they actually did live streaming from all of the subcommittee and committees at the General Assembly. So you could go on there and you could look at any committee or find a bill and you can find out when the testimony was going. Uh, on most of mine this year, I live streamed them on Facebook. The ones I didn't, we taped them and posted them on there later. So I think that's a great way of watching. And usually we'd show you what channels and what committees were meeting, you could watch it. And it worked pretty well. They had a, a technology glitch or two. Uh, but we're working to make sure the new General Assembly building, when it comes online, will have the technology abilities to get that out there. Uh, another thing I, I really would like to see us happen uh, in the House, uh, I don't believe that's the case in the Senate, but uh, we need to have all recorded votes. Because uh, in, in our subcommittees, which many bills die in the subcommittees, and it's only on a voice vote. So now at least we have live streaming so that gets out there, but if we really want transparency, those should be recorded votes. Uh, I can tell you, you know, uh, and I tell this to my constituents, you may not like every vote I take, but I will always tell you why I voted the way I voted, and I'd be glad to speak with you about it. Uh, I'm not going to run away from a vote I made, and I think they should all be recorded because I think the people are owed that transparency. Uh, so those are some, some things that need to be done on the other side to pro provide transparency. But I please write to your legislators, send them letters, uh, make phone calls to them. I get letters. Everyone who comes to my office writes me a letter, gets an answer back. Every one of them. Good. 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 Can, can you talk about the Senate transparency? <laughs> Right. Well, in the Senate, we have um, recorded votes, so you can look up in committee or wherever. But we also have proxies. So if you, a lot of, they're notorious for double scheduling people, so some, sometimes people have committee at the same time. So we can leave a proxy with another um, senator to vote our proxy um, at our, at our uh, instruction or at their discretion. That depends on the member, what they're going to do. But there was a bill a couple years ago um, for, I'm trying to remember who, whose legislation it was, but that to, for any testimony that's going to be provide, provided before a, um, a General Assembly committee um, to be under oath. So, you know, if, if you've ever been to the General Assembly, you know, we have committee rooms, that's really where, you know, most of the work is done. And it's usually, in the Senate, it's 15 people. 15 members and they're arranged by subject area and that's where we kind of vet the bills and you know the proponents gets up and t t gives their story and has has people get up and testify uh, stakeholders witnesses things testify in in, in support of it um, and so this was an attempt to to have that be um, under oath and it was a lot of people really I, I don't think like that because it is not a court or an adversarial proceeding and people. I think that you know that that was kind of the thought that it would turn into an adversarial type proceeding and, and put people on the defensive. Um, the other thing that's interesting is you know we don't know what kind of evidence or what kind of testimony is going to be provided until people get up and start testifying. Uh, I know that that's you know at the federal level they get their testimony you know to submit your testimony in advance. That's not how the General Assembly rolls. You know we. Everything is very fast paced and you know, we just get everything that morning. Sometimes you don't know you're gonna, your bill's going to be in a particular committee until you know, the day before or, or you know, maybe two days before if you're lucky. Um, so it's even hard to get your witnesses there, much less have them you know, give you all the, the issue of the testimony they're gonna provide. But, when you, but putting people under oath like that was really, I think, um, was perceived to possibly have a chilling effect on people who wanted to come down and testify or you know, come down and, and speak to their electeds about why they think a particular law should, be, should pass or should not pass. So that was some of why that did not pass. By the way, the committees and subcommittee meetings I mentioned, not only can you watch them online, you can also come to those in person. You can come right in there, and if there's a bill you want to talk about, uh, the, the uh, committee chairs will say, does anybody want to make comment? 
uh, either for or against the bill. You step up, state your name, where you're from, and give your give your uh, your piece. And uh, and I think that that's a, that is a citizen's right that you have. And I encourage you to to make your voice be heard because uh, when when residents come down and talk about an issue, people really listen, and it means a lot. Sir, did you? Have This is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of disinformation campaigns that can come about. And knowing that you guys only have between January, I forget the date, to what, March, something like that, April, um, you have, everything is fast paced. And you don't want to see a disinformation thing mess up your legislative system. You don't want it to take over too much of your time. That's why I'm saying if, if you got these reports way ahead of time and you could vet them and find out, okay, is this BS or is this actual, it has an actuality to it, an actual report. That's what I'm interested in. Sure, so I can answer that. The, the specific voter fraud uh, report that I was talking about that hearing took place outside of, of session. So we went to Richmond just for the day in the, the fall, in October, before the presidential election to address that. There are, are committees that meet year round in the General Assembly that focus on legislation or challenges or studies. They have studies that go through. And, and one of the things that you've heard Delegate Bell talking about was we're gonna have to go back and fix things. So we have the opportunity to go back and fix. So something will come to the House of Delegates, we pass it. Then it has to go over to the Senate where it can be changed and amended. And you have people who are looking at it with, with eye, you know, lots of sets of eyes to say, does this make sense? Does that make sense? Is this accurate? Is that? They can catch it. Then if it passes through both bodies, then it goes over the governor's uh, purview where there are really lots and lots of attorneys looking to make sure vetting it, looking at it again. Then if he agrees it, it comes back to us during the veto session if he doesn't sign it. So then we have yet another bite of the apple. Even if it goes through and passes, we always have the ability to go in and make amendments to, to current, current law or, or to make further changes. So if something was egregious and was false, we would have that opportunity if someone found out, oh, we didn't understand the, the parameters of this or those numbers weren't right. We have the ability to go back again, bring it back up, bring it before the body again. So that's, I guess, because it is, we are, you know, a short session, either 45 or 90 or 60 days, you know, we are looking at up to 3,000 pieces of legislation. It is like drinking water out of a fire hose. It is so overwhelming. But we have opportunities to go back and, and perfect things over and over again. There are some, you know, I, it has been, you know, the, we have been doing this since 1607. And it has, it has, been, not we, I mean, we are looking very well preserved, but the body has, it's the oldest continuing legislative body in the Western Hemisphere. So something has been working pretty well, I would say. Um, and I'm not apt to try to drastically change that because, um, because I think, having the opportunity to go back and relook at things and revisit things and change things gives us that flexibility. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Do bad things sometimes slip through? Absolutely they do. Do we sometimes miss things? Yes. Even, even people who are really focused in and doing their homework sometimes miss things, but we have the chance to go back and try to fix those things. So I hope that makes you feel a little bit better about it. Um, we certainly are trying our best though. I know that I get up around, I get to my office around 6.30 in the morning when we're in session, and I sometimes don't get back to my room until 10.30 at night because it is just all encompassing. And we are really trying to focus on making sure that we're making the best decisions possible for you all because we know that we represent you and we're wanting to make sure that we're, you know, doing you right, so. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and thank you for being here. Um, 
My name's Chris, and my question is, um, so the General Assembly approved legislation that would ban basically local governments from complying uh, with federal immigration law. Um, the governor said that he's gonna veto that, but uh, my question to each of you is, uh, what were your stances respectively in the Senate and House? Thank you. So I, I, the, I think the question is about this sanctuary, is this about the sanctuary cities yeah. bill? Okay, we don't, we don't actually have any sanctuary cities in Virginia, for starters, so this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, <laughs> but another, one of the issues that I had seen from, um, from what had been happening with um, holding uh, people on detainers is that a lot of times the feds, the feds wouldn't pick them up. And uh, that would be a problem because you're, you're, they're, they're staying in the jail, you don't have otherwise necessarily legal authority, and they're supposed to pick them up within what is it, 48 hours, 72 hours. And so, you know, in terms of a liberty issue to keep hanging on to them, and then in terms of a financial issue because it's expensive for the county to have to house inmates for an extended period without the feds picking them up. So that was a concern that I had. Um, but again, I think that this is really a, a solution in search of a problem. Yeah, I, I'm right on the same page as Senator Wexton. I don't feel like I need to go into any more detail, but I, I did not support it either. Yeah, my position is pretty much the same, and I did uh, talk with both of my local governments and get their opinion, and, and they actually were against it as well. Yeah. So uh, I, I thought that that made the most sense, and uh, I suspect this will be another one that will be debated many times in the future. Don't worry, we'll make sure you're here. Everybody's going to get a chance. Hi, um, I think we heard earlier um, so many um, comments in your report about concerns with people who are suffering mental illness or substance abuse, and certainly as we think about working families and the importance of the child care legislation you mentioned, um, housing is a foundational issue to all of these things, and I think um, one of the things we know is that Virginia, our rents have skyrocketed, skyrocketed um, in terms of the pace at which they've increased uh, compared to incomes. We're the 10th um, highest uh, state in terms of rental cost overall and up here in Northern Virginia, anybody that tries to um, look at things knows that you um, probably have to afford you know, $70,000 in income in a household just to afford rent on a two bedroom apartment. 50% of the jobs right here in Loudoun and Fairfax County pay less than 50,000 a year in terms of people that are working. So what would you all do? What have you um, supported and what will you do to help increase um, affordable housing um, development or to provide solutions for working families, individuals where rents aren't there, including the most vulnerable people that are suffering, uh, vets, um, seniors, and um, homeless? I agree with you completely on, on the severity of that problem. I actually did a bill this past year because two years ago we did a bill. Uh, actually, a bill was put forward, but I think it was really rushed through the General Assembly on proffers. It's very controversial. And uh, Loudoun County uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, Prince William County, very, very against that proffer bill. Fairfax County. Uh, and uh, actually, I work with them quite a bit. Uh, they, they, uh, I actually was able to get a couple of amendments to the bill, which made it better. Uh, but I still didn't like it. And there was actually some people saying, well, you voted for it in committee, but you voted against it on the floor. Why would you do that? Well, in order to get my amendments accepted in the committee, I had to vote for them, and, uh, which made the bill better, but it still wasn't a very good bill. Uh, and uh, this year I put in a, a, a bill to actually go back and amend that proper bill to allow uh, affordable dwelling units because that is not one of the criteria that's included in there. And I think it's, it's a real problem. Uh, I think it was an oversight when that bill was pushed through quickly because in the last two years we've had zero uh, affordable dwelling unit projects in Fairfax or Loudoun County and I know when I was in Richmond I asked both counties and they said the average for that time of the year would be anywhere from 10 to 15 for the last 10 years and we had zero in the pipeline. So I, I believe we're going to have a crisis in affordable dwelling units. Uh, in uh, Brambleton, which is uh, one of the developments that's in my district, 
Uh, there's a wonderful uh, apartment affordable dwelling unit. It took a lot of creative partnership to make that happen. And, and I, honestly, that apartment is really the first rung of, of a family who are really trying to get their children in grade school and move up the ladder of success. That's all they can afford is an apartment until they can save up to buy a home. Uh, within six months, they had a 600 uh, person waiting list. And, and it's a beautiful uh, place. I was at the grand opening, toured all the end, it's wonderful. We need to amend that, and I'll be honest, even though many of the developers are the ones that help push that proper bill through, all the developers in this area come to me saying, change that thing, because it's not working for us, and we, we, can, do, we can do better. Uh, it also really doesn't allow a lot of flexibility, uh, and I'm not for big proffers that would put the backs of old problems in a county on to new homeowners, but uh, there are some flexible things that sometimes can work great. For instance, we've had uh, we have a brand new library uh, being built just outside of Brambleton, where the county had land, and the developer was willing to build the library, but they didn't have land for it. So the county gave the land, and they built the library. So it actually gives the residents a wonderful library at a greatly reduced cost. Under the new proper bill, we couldn't do that because the library was just across the street from the development. It wasn't within the development proper. So a little bit more flexibility would allow us to do some things that just make sense, and I'm hoping affordable dwelling units is one of those. Uh, the last thing I'll say about affordable dwelling units is we need uh, more sizes, more size homes in it, because typically all the ADUs are really just for starter families. So they allow a teacher, a fireman, a policeman to live in the area where they work. And unfortunately, if it's a really small starter home, you have a couple children, uh, your family gets bigger, that doesn't meet your needs anymore. And then you can't afford to live in that neighborhood. So we need more flexibility so people can then have other homes that they can stay with in the ADU and allow them to work at a lesser salary they can make outside of the education realm, but still live in the neighborhood they serve. Because I'm a firm believer, having those folks in the neighborhoods they serve is so much better for all of us. So I, that was Carrie Wilson. She is the CEO of Cornerstones, which does a lot in the community to make life better for people living here. And um, I, you know, one of the things that Fairfax County has done is the Office to End and Prevent Homelessness. Those types of initiatives, I think, are a huge step in the right direction. We need to be spending uh, more towards our housing trust fund. I know that over the past few years that was basically gutted. I believe we were able to put a little bit more in this year. Um, but I also think the thing that nobody ever talks about when discussing affordable housing is the fact that we have so many families here working for wages that are just not livable. So I've done a, a few things here. Um, we know that the majority of people in poverty are single households with a woman leading that household. So I try to uh, do a few bills on uh, equal pay for equal work. Um, that I, th I think we have to make sure that everybody who is doing a job equal to someone else is paid fairly and reasonably. There have also been bills uh, to increase our minimum wage, um, which I will continue to stand up for because I have people who live in my district who work three jobs. They still aren't able to be at home with their kids on the weekend, and so we have to provide volunteers who give the children um, backpacks with food for their weekends because they're not going to eat otherwise. That's a shame in a community that is as wealthy and prosperous as uh, we are in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax County, and Loudoun County. Thirdly, we have to look at the cost of child care because um, I was at a, actually I was at the Dulles Airport um, event, the Committee for Dulles, talking about the economic um, out, out, you know, the forecast for the next few years. The gentleman who came, uh, works for um, George Mason University, he's an economist, he said the biggest issues are affordable housing, transportation costs, and child care. So we've got to expand access to child care here in uh, Virginia as well because if families can't take care of their kids, if they're not making a livable wage, if people don't have a place to live, then we don't have a quality of life for folks. And it shouldn't be just the haves and the have-nots. We should have a prosperous and strong middle class. The, the final thing is, you know, building jobs, making sure that people are trained and have access to a good, well-paying job is just, should be the backbone, and, and uh, I, I will continue to work for that, so. This is, you clearly hit a nerve with this one because that's, it, it's a big deal in Loudoun County. 
Um, and I, rather than, you know, I'm not going to reiterate what Delia Bell and Boisco said, although I agree with everything, um, I would just add that this is really, this is, this is a big issue for us in terms of being able to attract employers. Um, because, you know, Verizon has a big campus in Ashburn, guess what? They're moving out, you know why? Because it's too expensive for the employees to live here, and it takes them forever to, to get to work in the morning. So it becomes a transportation issue, because we have people like the uh, sheriff's deputies who do court security at the Loudoun County Courthouse who live in Pennsylvania and drive in and, and home from Pennsylvania every morning um, and evening. And people from, from West Virginia coming in and driving on, on our roads. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And so that's a big part of it. Um, a lot of it, and I don't, I'm not trying to push this off on the locality, but a lot of it has to do with uh, our local government and how they decide to, you know, to develop with development and how they're going to do that plan. Uh, Envision Labs is going on right now, so that's one of the things that they're redoing the, the comp plan. Um, if you have thoughts about that, I think that you know it would behoove you to make those pu public, make those thoughts public. Um, one of the things I think that is so wonderful about Loudoun County and that I really love about living here is that we have really preserved the rural west, right? So we have a lot of beautiful uh, views and vistas and farms and I mean, all, we've got all the wineries out there and stuff like that now and that's fantastic. That's much better than having a bunch of, you know, McMansions <laughs> dotting our landscape. So they need to leverage the development around uh, transit with the, with the Silver Line coming in. And you know, we, fortunately, we have millennials coming up. One of the things that, that we've been talking about is, well, how do we attract millennials to Loudoun County? Because guess what? They all want to live in Arlington, or they all want to live in Maryfield. You know, they don't want to come to Loudoun County. So we need to really leverage our development, build more of these live, work, play communities, where apparently you can take your alcoholic beverage and wander around <laughs> now. Um, but truly, with, with, because they, they don't necessarily want you know the big sprawling McMansion. You know to have like a smaller, to have more uh, units that are more affordable. And again, I would reiterate the, the housing trust fund and uh, making sure that we fully fund the HDA and give them the ability to make grants to first time home buyers uh, who would not otherwise be able to, to buy homes. Um, and the, the, and have, encourage them to stay put um, over a period of years. So, good question. Right, so this will have to be the last question, but if you do, oh, the last one. one. <laughs> but if you have further questions, feel free to come up and ask the, the legislators afterwards. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. I'm George Casuto. I teach civics at Harmony, which is uh, here in uh, Loudoun County. And as a civics teacher, I got so many different questions we might have to keep you after. Uh, but I did want to just let you know about Jamie Raskin is a federal representative from Maryland, 8th Congressional District, and he's got the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact Bravo. proposal. Uh, just for everybody who wants to know about that, it's an agreement among U.S. states and the District of Columbia to award their respective electoral votes to whichever presidential candidate wins the overall popular vote in the 50 states. So whoever wins the popular vote, that state makes a commitment to give all of their electoral votes to that candidate. Uh, and Virginia, as I can see here in this Wikipedia article, is not enacted and no bill pending. So maybe one of you would like to talk to Rep Representative Raskin and you know get a bill going through the uh, General Assembly, which would commit the 13 electoral votes of Virginia to whoever wins the popular vote. And what happened in 2016, once they hit 270, they get enough states to agree to 270 electoral votes, then it's, it, it goes into effect and it has legal force. So we wouldn't see uh, you know, a, a situation like we saw in, in both in 2000 and 2016. Give us some thought. You can Google it if you're interested in it. But uh, as, a, um, as a teacher here in Loudoun, I just would hope that some of the onerous federal uh, policies, and you know, most teachers I think were opposed to the nomination and confirmation of Betsy DeVos, and we found you know that her policies uh, run counter to what we stand for as teachers, including protecting LGBT community and also school choice, which is really a misnomer because it's taking money away from the public schools and and giving it to private schools. So we just want to know what can the state legislature do to insulate itself from some of the onerous federal policies that we see coming from the Department of Education. Well, a lot of those bills passed in the House of Delegates, passed through the legislature. 
So the school choice bill that would have taken money, let people take their tax dollars and send them to either home school or a private school, that passed. Um, there were just a whole number of, of legislative efforts that Betsy DeVos would love that passed, but it was our governor um, and um, his veto that put a stop to that. We, we in the House of Delegates and in the Senate also were able to sustain the governor's vetoes. So you just want to um, think about who you're voting for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Is, was there any other question or was that the only one back there, sir? Did you, I saw your hand up and say, did anybody else have a question you didn't ask one so far? Yeah. 